economy and labor market for the District of Columbia. The Office of Cable Television, a war winning content provides resourceful information on government activity, education, current events, history, music, arts, and entertainment. The Office of Cable Television operates and manages the, district's the District of Columbia's television access channels, uh, DCC, DCN, the District Knowledge Network, District of Columbia Entertainment Network, and a 24-hour on-demand streaming network, and District's first government radio station, DC Radio 96.3 HD4 digital radio station, in partnership with Howard University, WHUR. As I call this first panel of witnesses, they will they will be promoted from the audience to being a panelist. All public witnesses uh, will have a lot of amount of three minutes, and those who uh, are in a physical capacity or represent the organization um, will have five minutes. We're going to start with Miss Linda Green, Amy Bonnet, Trump Troopy Patel. Campos. While we're waiting for others to come in, I had a tremendous opportunity to work uh, with Officer Cable Television. And I try to use a short name because um, I know we changed it to a longer name, which is to be fitting of the many responsibilities and roles of the agency. But I met some remarkable staff there and did some great filming. Um, so I want to give my kudos to the team there um, and the editing team and the filming team. You guys were fantastic amongst the other work you're doing throughout the city. Miss Green? Yes, good morning. What is on? <laughs> Good morning, Chairman White. I'm mm -hmm. Linda Mercado Green, owner and CEO of Anacostia Organics, the first DC licensed medical cannabis dispensary east of the river, located in historic Anacostia, and now the only DC licensed medical cannabis dispensary in Ward 7 and 8. We are a Black woman owned and managed dispensary, hiring staff from our own community. Anacostia Organics had our ribbon cutting ceremony and open house on January 24, 2019 with Mayor Bowser, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, you Council Member White, and many other leadership officials, dignitaries, residents, and supporters. It was a huge surprise to me when I received a call a day or so prior to the ceremony uh, from the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment uh, that they would be bringing a camera crew to film our grand opening. A couple of weeks later, after being interviewed on the 202 show, I received a call to come meet with the ACP team regarding cannabis programming. A couple of weeks later, Cannabis Conversations podcast with Linda Mercado Green was born. We are now in our fifth year of recording and the show has been a major success. To my knowledge, my show was and is the only government-sponsored cannabis broadcast, not only in D.C., but in the United States. This collaboration has been extremely successful in educating the general public, not only in our region, but from around the world about the benefits of medicinal cannabis, the complex nuances of the cannabis industry, and how to use cannabis safely through interviews with top experts locally and nationally. Needless to say, Cannabis Conversations podcast has given Anacostia Organics fame and credibility. The broadcast is distributed on multiple outlets to include DC Radio, 96.3 HD4, SoundCloud, YouTube, and other streaming services. Because of the creativity and assistance of the leadership of Octomy, DC residents have a valid source to gain knowledge and learn fact from fiction regarding the cannabis industry. I want to thank Mayor Bowser, former director of Octomy, Angie Gates, our new director, Latoya Foster, director of Radio Max Marek and his fantastic staff, 
and the other team members of Octomy for giving me this opportunity to educate our residents. I have a very strong feeling that the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and, and Entertainment is going to continue to expand and exceed all expectations, being a role model for other cities across the country. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I'm available if you have any questions. You're muted, Councilman. Thank you. I'm just talking away. <laughs> now to our, own, our next council, our next uh, public witness, Amy Barnett. Bomet. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Chairman White, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Amy K. Bormid. I'm a pianist, a vocalist, and a composer based here in D.C. Uh, I'm a Duke Ellington School of the Arts graduate. I'm a Howard University graduate, and I'm also the director of the Washington Women and Jazz Festival, now in our 14th year, and the owner of Strange Woman Records. Um, as an active participant in the creative scene and someone deeply involved in the success of DC-based artists, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation for the opportunity to share my perspective on the invaluable work of the Office of Cable TV, Film, Music, and Entertainment. Um, under the leadership of director Latoya Foster, Foster Aquami has played a pivotal role in my career and my ability to base my work here in the district. Director Foster's commitment to promoting the diverse talents that make up our cultural landscape has had a profound impact. And I am grateful for the opportunity to work alongside her and the rest of the 202 Creates team in contributing to the growth and prosperity of our creative community. Um, Akfumi has been instrumental in providing vital support and numerous resources to local artists, filmmakers, musicians, and other creatives like me. Through the 202 Creates residency program, the office has created a platform for our homegrown talents to shine and has facilitated an environment where innovation and expression can thrive. As a previous artist in residence in the 202 Creates cohort and someone deeply involved in the local music scene, I have witnessed firsthand the positive impact Akvami has had on artist careers and the overall cultural identity of our city. I have relied on the resources available, the photo studio, the podcast studio, the co-working days, and the business coaching to support my work. I believe in this program, volunteering my time as a mentor and continuing to work with and support artists I met as part of the 202 Creates residency program. As a graduate of Duke Ellington School of the Arts, growing up in DC, working with different creatives, these type of diverse artistic collaborations are core to my growth as an artist and as a community leader. Uh, I am confident that through the structures and programming provided by Offer Me, our city will continue to flourish as a hub of creative and artistic expression. In conclusion, I am grateful for the ongoing collaboration between Akfami and the artistic community. Together, we can continue to cultivate an environment, an environment where our local talents are celebrated, nurtured, and provided with the support they need to thrive. So thank you all for your time and attention and your dedication to the cultural traditions of DC. Thank you. One second. Uh, Troop T. Patel. I don't see. Okay, go to the next one. Campos. I am here. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. I am a cultural architect with uh, experiences that range from C public school to C suite nonprofit executive serving high need communities in DC to full time creative. If I think it was locked up, just pose. I think your phone went out. 
Give us some sound so I can see if I can hear you. Nothing yet. I can see you moving the camera, but it's frozen. Nothing yet. I can see you moving again. I heard something. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can hear you now. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. I am a cultural architect with experiences that range from DC public school educator to C-suite nonprofit executive serving high needs communities in DC to full-time creative. I have spent my entire adult life and professional career fighting for justice, access and equity in my beloved hometown, amplifying voices, shifting narratives, building community and continually striving to be the living embodiment of server le servant leader, warrior and healer. Currently as a musician, creative director and chief dot connector for the DC based Black Alley Band, I am consistently impressed by Mayor Bowser's and the DC Council's support for and dedication to the local creative economy. Uh, now, more than ever, it is important to share the positive impact that the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment under the stewardship of Director LaToya Foster has had and will continue to have a, on the thousands of creative economy workers in the District of Columbia. Octomy is designed to assist and inspire creatives locally, around the country, and around the world. The unique mission and duties assigned to the agency allows DC to continue to rise as a major competitor in the global entertainment industry and has set the framework for DC as a regional, national, and global creative hub. But most importantly uh, is a wide variety of beneficial services Octomy directly provides to local creatives. From financial and promotional support to the film production, television programming, and workforce development, the Octomy team is an unparalleled direct resource for the district's creative residents. Director Foster and the Octomy staff are committed to the values and mission of the agency and to promoting creative and to promoting creative economy development in DC. Each and every employee that I have interacted with in the agency has come to work and support with a smile uh, and eagerly engages with me and the community to see that above all else, um, creatives and residents needs are met. Um, the level of talent, commitment uh, to the mission and the passion for the job at Octomy is unmatched. The 202 Creates team, for example, works tirelessly with local independent creatives across artistic disciplines to provide best practice workshops, networking opportunities, and an array of opportunities for DC-based creative. As a direct result of these opportunities, Black Alley Band in particular has been able to produce culturally responsive learning tools that creatively respond to the social development, social developmental needs of the city's young people, raise awareness around critical issues of environmental sustainability and climate change and how they are interconnected with our community's demands for social justice, and forge international relationships in Ghana, Uganda, Tanzania, Lebanon, and Armenia, and engaging in cultural exchange and collaborating with artists from those countries sharing authentic go-go music with those cultures and allowing musicians from DC to travel the world and bring those experiences, knowledge, and connections home with them as we work to empower our communities here in DC. Dedication to public service and the arts exists throughout the OFMI staff, from the DC radio team to the programming team and the considerable work that goes into planning and hosting the annual 202 Create Months. Uh, 202 Creates Month. Alchemy is not limited to content creation and production, however. Under the leadership of Director Foster, the office continues to place a strong emphasis on job creation and workforce development. The office sponsors and or implements various programs that provide training and help level the playing field for DC creatives 
who would otherwise lack access to such learning and professional opportunities. While there are still significant challenges for creatives to overcome, Alchemy is certainly alleviating many of the obstacles that hinder local creatives and help them achieve success and participate in the local economy. Now more than ever, the services, expertise, and mission of Alchemy are needed in the District of Columbia. The agency must maintain programs that work to equitably revitalize the economy and see that DC residents are given the opportunities to diversify their skill sets and professional qualifications. The city must continue to support Achmi in its unique role of strengthening the creative economy, and thus the economic outlook for hundreds, if not thousands, of DC residents. Um, I thank Mayor Bowser, the DC Council, uh, the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs, Chairman Treyon White, Director Latoya Foster, and the entire Achmi staff for their continued commitment uh, to the creative workers in DC and for their dedication to strengthening the arts and cultural sectors of our communities. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I want to go back to Miss um, Green. Uh, I want to yeah. ask you, uh, I want to give you kudos for being bold and standing <laughs> on the front line and creating a safe space to talk about the cannabis industry, the medical cannab cannabis industry. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to know from you, from your podcast, uh, are you saying that people are more uh, susceptible to uh, those who may, may have not known the benefits of cannabis? Uh, how do you see that, the, that this office helped you to educate, empower, and get information out to the general public? Um, first of all, it being a licensed um, cannabis uh, entity, um, not only in the in DC but across the country, we're not allowed to advertise or really do a lot of marketing. So this gives a uh, broad range, not just from uh, for DC residents, um, but like I said, from all over the world, we get patients in from everywhere and patients are listening to my podcast in London, um, parts of Africa and other places. Uh, for DC residents, um, one of my commitments was to educate um, our residents on the benefits of cannabis, um, educate them on the nuances of getting in the industry, what we face in the industry, because this is not a normal business and it doesn't operate like a normal business and we don't have the benefits of a normal business. So uh, before um, everybody wants to, you know, to get in the door, everybody wants to have a license, everybody wants to sell cannabis, grow cannabis and this and that, but there are a lot of rules and regulations which um, we are on the Hill fighting for uh, legalization, safe banking, um, and um, uh, descheduling, rescheduling, and those type of things. So it goes beyond the DC scene. It goes, it's the national scene. Um, and so um, they come in and surprisingly, of all races, uh, age groups, and everything, say, I heard your podcast. I heard your podcast. I'm listening to it, and this and that and other stuff. So it's been, it's been really. Um, the impetus for me to keep going because it does take time for me to find guests, book guests, and then do the podcast, you know, so that takes away from my business. But um, at the same time, um, it's really um, helping uh, people understand the, uh, the plant. Got it. Thank you for that. You have to send me that so I can check you out and support it. Um, um, send that to me, please. I want to jump to Miss okay. Borman. Oh, um, can you provide me some more details? Uh, you mentioned in your uh, testimony that uh, Two or Two Creates uh, program has enhanced the create the creative community. Can you give us some more details what that means? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, for me the biggest thing has been uh, the residency program that I took part in, um, starting in two thousand twenty-two. Mm -hmm. And being a part of that cohort was really great because the experience that I had um, coming up as an artist at Duke Ellington was interacting with a lot of different types of artists and different types of 
uh, creatives. And so um, that's something that I moved uh, to LA and was, was interacting with a, you know, a lot of different types of media. And that's when I moved back to DC was one of the things that I was looking for um, to continue my own artistic growth was to have, uh, you know, no friends that are comedians and making films and, and be collaborating with people and doing interesting things and not just, you know, uh, playing piano at the church, like doing a lot of different, uh, different types of, of yeah. Gigs. And, uh, you and you named a, a peculiar thing. women's group that you're a part of. I'm not. I, I missed it. I was trying to. Well, it had a peculiar name though. What was it? Uh, it's Washington Women in Jazz. Washington Women. No, that wasn't it. It was something else you said. Oh, my record. I have a record label, Strange Woman Records. St there it is. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's been really cool. I've been. You know, I have events um, for the record label and for Washington Women in Jazz, and um, you know, two two creates um, is always helping me and supporting me uh, in promoting those events and uh, connecting me with videographers and and uh, photographers and things like that um, to create those. So. And what and what what all you what all instruments do you play? I play piano and I'm a singer and I right. um, do a lot of composing and I play a really um, mediocre accordion. <laughs> okay. So how did you hear about 202 Creates and what uh, Officer K would tell in the film entertainment office? So I, I heard about it um, from Herb Scott, who is a, a friend and a colleague of mine. We went to Ellington together and he's a, a jazz saxophonist and also is the director of uh, Capitol Hill Jazz Foundation. And I heard you say you do some actual like mentoring um, and, and residency. Uh, how many people have you worked with and, and what do they do? Yeah, um, I've worked with two different people. And now I'm not going to remember the name of the first woman I worked with, uh, who was a filmmaker. Um, and then I worked um, with uh, Pinky Killicorn, who is a really great uh, hip hop artist. Pinky, very well. Yeah. yeah, she's awesome. So, um, you know, it's been I, I say it's a mentorship, but it's very much a mutual mentorship, um, you know, because I, I came out of the program um, learning some different right. things about business and um, getting some different perspectives and then was immediately asked to be uh, in the role of a mentor. So it's it's a lot of mutual mentorship where we're getting different things from, you know, the different ways we set up our careers and um, ideas from each other. So that's been really cool to, to reach out um, because I am pretty entrenched in. Uh, in jazz music, I love jazz music. So it's nice to have some different, uh, some different genres, and think about different ways people are promoting things and how they're putting their music together and who they're working with. Got it. Um, and how long have you been a part of the, uh, I guess, the family of Acme? Um. Well, officially since the residency in uh, twenty twenty two, which I did in the at the beginning of twenty twenty two. Um, I moved back to DC uh in 2021 so i started uh using some of the uh you know the photo studios and things like that um and looking for uh looking for connections to different creatives photographers and writers and things like that through 202 creates okay. um even earlier got it well, well thank you for uh, speaking this morning i'm sending you a my message as well Perfect. um Um, so I want to jump to you, Cam. You still here? Yes, I'm still here. Uh, good morning. So, Cam, you got a lot of stuff going on here. Did, did I hear you say you're a metro architect? Oh, no, uh, cultural, cultural architect. Oh, cultural architect, musician, uh, advocate, mm -hmm. uh, a healer, a justice yeah. advocate, <laughs> uh, you, you know, you do a lot of things, but I know I see you often with the Black Alley family. Um, how do you feel that uh, this office uh, empowers and enhances the, the sound of GoGo -Go to reach more people? I heard you talk about trips across the world. If you can touch on that real quick. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first, I mean, they really made uh made me as my love for go go growing up in dc and then actually you know being a part of the go go community with my work with black alley it made me feel welcome which was you know not always not always the case uh in dc and government and i mean um you know that door swings both ways 
Uh, but at the same time, they they opened that door. You know, they opened that door. They made me feel welcome uh, and feel like they authentically wanted to, you know, be more of an ally and be um, more supportive of, of, you know, advancing, uh, protecting, number one, protecting GoGo and then advancing the culture. Um, and so they encouraged me to apply for um, the, to be a 202 resident before the corona, I think it was 2019. I think it was part of the 2019 cohort. Um, and in one of the network meetings that they had down um, down at the office, at the 202 Creates office, um, you know, they connected me with, um, uh, I forget the guy's name now, but he worked for the State Department, United States State Department, um, and did, you know, um, cultural diplomacy work with, with, with the State Department. And from there, you know, I just they they just they just were supportive, uh, not only financially, but then just in terms of, you know, um, uh, making sure that those conversations were followed up, uh, followed up on, followed through with, and um, you know, long story short, man, we were able to go first to Ghana and then to Uganda, Tanzania, um, and then most recently to Lebanon and Armenia. Wow! Wow! I I had I I was uh on Miss Kiana's page uh Southside Creatives and I saw uh Malik the dope drummer on there this morning and I thought to myself wow how can we empower and and get our artists and our creatives more opportunities and more um light and shine and just a more a higher platform. And when I saw that, you know, I remember that he was on another show that was international. But people like him or them that are in that space, um, even thinking about housing, because uh, there are a lot of musicians, artists uh, that do do that part time, but would love to do it full time if they if the district can undergird some of their other expenses. Um, we did open up an artist house in Ward 8 in 20, 2023. What's 2022? Uh, on Mississippi Avenue, but I also often think about that. Like you know, DC has had you know has been the foundation for a lot of people to launch their careers, and GoGo is our hometown music. And so I just want to know your thoughts on that, if you have any. Yeah, I mean, I, listen, I would love to have more uh, more affordable housing, especially for for artists. I mean, I think that is, you know, I think that it's fair. I think that it's an investment. A lot of people look at that as subsidizing, but I look at it more as an investment. Like, um, you know, we, when a city is, you know, cities attract business and residents and, you know, sort of like the leading people in tech and education and all of that, because, you know, those, those people want to be around a city that has a certain authentic vibe um, and bring the culture. And, you know, um, not go go in particular, but not just o only go go. You know, all of the creatives in DC significantly contribute to the authentic vibe. It gives DC sort of this, um, um, this place where people want to come, want to live, uh, want want to lay roots in. Um, that's aside from the federal, you know, aside from the federal, aside from the White House and the Capitol and stuff. So, um, you know, supporting artists. Uh, in terms of housing, I know in Mount Rain, I'm uh, councilman. I'm I'm so thankful, man, for you for what you're doing with the creatives in Ward Eight. Um, but you know, even more throughout the city, because we can't all just be concentrated in, in Ward Eight. So even more opportunities for um, affordable housing throughout the city would be great. Um, the first that I knew of that was actually right across the line in Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier had these artist lofts, and I know a few people from the GoGo community was able to get in there. But we should have to okay. go to Maryland. You know what I'm saying? We should be able to come come to DC. So yeah, I'm with you on that for sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Thank you, man. Um, Shay, you keep up the good work, man. You you're doing an excellent job. Um, and we appreciate your leadership in this industry and all the other things you do around the city. Thank you. I want to thank all those who testified today. I'm over two minutes over my time, so I'm moving right along. We're going to move to this section of this uh, public uh, oversight hearing, performance oversight hearing 
um, with our government witnesses. And so if we can elevate uh, the director, Latoya Foster, to the panel, it would be great. He was still waiting for the director. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. The infamous Mr. Toya Foster. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, my friend. How are you this morning? Um, great, great. L late nights, early mornings. You know how I go around. You know here. it. Yep. You um, it. so it is the it is the practice of this office to swear in all government witnesses. Um, would anyone else be speaking besides you in your office? Uh, I do have members of my team on uh, that I may need to pass some questions on to uh, if there are some uh, really intricate details that we need to uh, make sure that you have. Uh, but I do plan to answer the questions. OK, we're going to ask anybody who will be speaking to uh, cut their camera on and raise their right hand. We want to swear in all government witnesses. I think we're waiting for one more. There we go. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give today is the truth? I do. You got to unmute yourself and say yes or I do. Yes. Sorry. I do. Yeah. I do. I, I, I got y'all on camera now. I got you. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Director Foster, you can go right ahead with your opening statement or presentation. All right. Well, again, good morning, uh, Chairman White and members of uh, this committee. Uh, I'm Latoya Foster, the director of the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music and Entertainment. I do have testimony prepared, but I think first, before we go into that testimony, we do, of course, kick things off with a video reel. So uh, we could get that video reel going because we believe that video will tell you the story that you want to hear about what we've been doing over the past year, Council Member. Well, good evening, everybody. I want to acknowledge Latoya Foster and our entire team at the Office of Cable, Television, Films, Music, and Entertainment. Are you with me? The district is a city that's got it all. And our job is to let the world know BC is back. Throughout 2023, OCTFME did just that. And we were everywhere. Our multi-Emmy award-winning team launched new programs to engage with residents, support our creative economy, and promote our shared D.C. values. D.C. Radio marked its sixth anniversary as the District of Columbia's first government radio station and one of only two municipally owned full-powered radio stations in the country. With a growing audience who tune in to hear big time guests, fascinating conversations, and an eclectic mix of music you won't hear anywhere else on the dial. DC Radio connects residents through diverse local programming, 
and continues to expand its reach with a host of new shows on a range of topics from finding your voice after 40, challenges facing returning citizens, sports in the DMV, and all things hip hop, just to name a few. In the hip hop corridor, giving you hip hop and more. Honoring the ones, man, who saved it, who really made it. While DC Radio was busy bringing new voices to the airwaves, our legal and regulatory teams were hard at work, ensuring that the district's cable providers were delivering on their commitments to the city, while also supporting residents to resolve any cable disputes and providing top-notch customer service every step of the way. Be very aware of your remote control functions because it can cost you in the end. Visit the website listed below to answer many of the questions that you may have regarding cable service. Lord, I hope and pray they come today. Want proof that DC is back? Look no further than our film division. More and more filmmakers are choosing to bring major productions to DC, thanks in large part to the success of our film rebate funds. It's extremely important for any major city to have a competitive rebate or tax incentive program. The impact has been incredible and filming in the district was through the roof. We had impact into the district of over $50 million, 600 district resident jobs, and $2 million in compensation to district residents. A great percentage of those projects were from production companies that are locally based, and many of those are led by African-American filmmakers. Speak Out DC is a safe space for conversation about topics and issues that matter to teens and young adults. Hosted by DC Youth Mayor Addison Rose. Today, we're talking about young people and gun violence and what we can do to stop it. Elevating voices on the most critical challenges facing our city is a central focus for our programming team. And the result has been an array of new content for our three channels, along with DCE, the city's first and only streaming network, enabling our programming to reach a global audience. And while we work to expand our reach beyond DC, we continue our commitment to provide district residents with the full access to DC government that they have come to expect, enabling residents to have accurate, up-to-date information in real time. But it doesn't stop there. We take our responsibility to entertain very seriously. Our efforts haven't gone unnoticed this year with two Emmy nominations and three NATO awards in recognition of our programs on Black History Month, Logo Music, and DC's very own hat lady, Ms. Vanilla Bean. Our creative economy reminds us of who we are and where we came from. In every ward and in every way, our Creative Affairs Office provides support to artists and promotes all the ways they enrich our communities through a wide range of programs and events. September in DC is now known as 202 Creates Month. We pull out all the stops with an entire month of programming dedicated to promoting our creative economy. Kicking off at the Point DC and culminating with an unforgettable night at the Lincoln Theater with the 38th Annual Mayor's Arts Awards, honoring up and coming talent and distinguished honorees who have been creating in the district for decades. With everything we've accomplished over the past year and all that we plan to do in the future, our message to the world is simple. Our city is second to none and DC is back. How'd we do, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, excellent. I see you had a... <laughs> A, a young, handsome guy in there a few times. I appreciate that. How about that? Yeah. Look very familiar, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are doing remarkable work in the district. We are happy to have you and your team. It's, well, we thank you amazing. so much, Mr. Chairman, for all of your support. Uh, I will now go into testimony uh, and then 
we can go to um, questions that I'm sure you have for us. Great. Go right All right. So again, good morning, Chairperson White, members and staff of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs. I'm Latoya Foster, the Director of the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment. On behalf of Mayor Bowser and the agency, I am very pleased to provide testimony about the activities and accomplishments of OCTFME in fiscal year 23 and fiscal year 24 to date. The mission of the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music and Entertainment is to regulate cable television service providers, provide high quality, responsive customer service for DC cable subscribers, to produce and broadcast 24 hour public educational and government programming and original content highlighting the district's culture, to lead, grow, and support a sustainable creative economy and entertainment media industry by managing programs and initiatives such as the Film Rebate Fund, 202 Create, and through activities of the Creative Affairs Office. And finally, to serve as the entertainment economic engine and communications hub for the DC government a one-stop shop for all things entertainment, including concerts, festivals, films, television productions, gaming, and immersive media. Mayor Bowser's fiscal year 23 budget made investments that supported our efforts to deliver on the promise of shared DC values. These efforts include creating economic opportunity, making our neighborhoods safer, and providing more effective and efficient government services. We continue to work each day to fulfill our commitment to provide DC residents with opportunities and a pathway to the middle class. OCTFME's legal and regulatory team continue to work closely with the district's three cable and internet service providers to ensure prompt resolution of customer service and infrastructure issues. As advocates for our district cable and broadband customers, our team serves as a general resource to identify ways customers can secure greater value for their services. The team also continue to facilitate the provider's efforts to upgrade technology throughout the district. As the agency transitions to more in-person interaction with various stakeholders, OCTFME has continued to provide transparency and valuable information to DC residents to, through its three peg channels, DCN, DCC, and DKN. In fiscal year 23, our production crew covered over 500 mayoral press conferences, groundbreakings, ribbon cuttings, studio productions, and community events presented by the Executive Office of the Mayor, government agencies, and community partners. <coughs> Excuse me. Additionally, our programming team showcased 356 virtual, hybrid, and in-person hearings on DCC, with the support of the DC Council. Our broadcasts are not only aired on our channels, but are service to the press pool, media outlets, and news pool providing organizations and news outlets resources in the collection of news. In a historic move, OCTFME partnered with eSpat Studios, a global creator of premium product for the gaming culture, and representing the convergence of music, fashion, art, technology, artificial intelligence, and sports to collaborate in the production of television programs and events. The collaboration will produce virtual, digital, live, and immersive media content for our global streaming network, DCE. Our multi-Emmy award-winning team worked with DC Youth Mayor Addison Rose to produce a six-episode series titled Speak Out DC. This series gave a voice and a platform for young adults to express concerns and offer opinions on local and national concerns, including violence, suicide prevention, and racial inequities. 
OCTFMB also continued its support of the city's professional sports teams and arenas by embarking on a docu-series titled District of Champions. The series showcases the Capital One Arena, Nationals Park, Audi Field, and the entertainment and sports arena, as well as the teams and events that fill their seats. Also, Game Time, a weekly radio sports talk show series, was created to cover professional, amateur, high school, and college sports in the DMV and provide information on top spots in the downtown area to enjoy pre- and post-game activities. OCTFME also collaborated with the DC Corrections Information Council to assist in the production of a documentary. The agency created compelling programming to support the city's resources and programs directed toward returning citizens. This program also aired on our global streaming network, DCE. OCTFME remains consistent in airing hundreds of hours of diverse and award-winning programming, earning Emmy nominations in the category of lighting for the holiday spirit joy and the category of writing for DCPS's Crushing the Game and garnering three National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors NATOA Awards including an award for OCTFME Salutes Black History Month, an award of distinction for our ongoing Go-Go music series, Straight Crankin', featuring the Junkyard Band, and an award of excellence for a video tribute remembering Ms. Vanilla Bean. Lastly, OCTFME continues to produce programming that highlights our businesses, our vibrancy, and our arts and culture scene in support of our downtown efforts. In lieu of major equipment upgrades in fiscal year 23, the operations division worked to address some predictable system shortfalls that could negatively impact the agency's infrastructure operations. The assessment and replacement of the studio's humidification system and the evaluation of the agency's building automation system, a computer system that controls certain functions of the building, such as heating, air conditioning, fire, and security, are two examples of this important work. Also during this performance period, DC Radio, a partnership with Howard University's WHUR 96.3, continue to produce high quality content. Our programming included audio and video podcasts, PSAs, and promotions, which aired across our digital and social media platforms. Among the voices heard on the station were R&B crooner Raheem Devon, former Washington Commanders Fred Smoot, and a host of others. OCTFME's film division is a one-stop shop that issues film permits, provides production location assistance, and manages the film rebate fund. The DC Film Rebate Fund promotes economic impact by generating revenue for DC businesses, promoting tourism, creating jobs, and providing media training opportunities for DC residents. In fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23, the DC Film Rebate Fund issued film incentive rebate awards to 17 qualifying media production projects, including support for nine projects produced by four local minority owned production companies. Based on currently available economic impact data, the overall direct, indirect, and induced program impact for the rebate fund projects exceeded $50 million. The projects created over 600 DC resident job hires and an estimated $2 million in wages to DC residents. OCTFME's Creative Economy Career Access Program, CCAP, is an innovative workforce development program that connects DC residents from underrepresented communities with local creative economy skills training and paid on the job mentorship placements. During fiscal year 23, the CCAP Media and CCAP Stagehand programs served a total of six DC residents. As a division of OCTFME, the Creative Affairs Office showcases and preserves the district's rich creative communities 
throughout all eight wards. CAO builds sustainability in the creative community through policy and programming, which further expands the pathway to the middle class for the creative workforce. In accordance with the GoGo -Go People's Plan, CAO rallies behind artists, initiatives, and programs designed to preserve and promote the district's GoGo -Go music, history, and culture. Throughout fiscal year 23, GoGo -Go Music was placed at the forefront via the expenditure of the GoGo -Go Fund throughout the community and the highlighting of the genre into agency events such as GoGo -Go performances with the Golden Triangle Bid, the Mayor's Arts Awards, 202 Creates Kickoff, and Juneteenth and Emancipation Day weekend celebrations. CAO also held the third annual Keep the Beat Week on February 13th through the 17th, which recognized the third anniversary of the signing of the GoGo -Go Official Music of the District of Columbia Designation Act of 2019. During this week, CAO produced a GoGo -Go press conference at the MLK Library that spoke to advances made since the bill signing and what's yet to come. The press conference features speakers from the GoGo -Go community, such as Ron Moten, Big G of the Backyard Band, and Cameron Poles of Black Alley, who we just heard from. The event ended with a performance from Crank Caviar. During Keep the Beat Week, CAO also held a Kids Crank Youth Go Go at Hook Hall, which featured Pocket Three, a Youth Go Go Band, Go Go Mascots, a Go Go History Session for the Youth, and so much more. CAO also continued its support of the Performing Arts Promotion Amendment Act, PAPA, Real Property Tax Rebate Program for Small Performing Arts Venues. In fiscal year 23, OCTFME assumed responsibility for reviewing and certifying eligibility of all PAPA rebate applications and received the most applications to date. In partnership with the George Washington University, CAO continued its Care for Creatives initiative, which provides confidential, pay-what-you-can mental health counseling to creatives, entrepreneurs, and small business owners. CAO also held the fourth installment of the Business Over Brand Summit on June 24th through the 28th which provides di district creatives with access to resources to build their businesses and grow their brands. CAO held a week of dynamic events and programming for the creative community that featured a networking event, a creator summit with panels focused on creatives and tech, government resources for creatives and marketing and branding 101. This week also featured an engaging Music Matters panel hosted by Abba Kwawu that covered the music industry basics from public relations, management, artist stylists, and record executives. The impactful summit featured over 20 speakers from local and national organizations. CAO also houses the 202 Creates Residency Program, which promotes and amplifies the district's creative economy and residents. The residency connects and builds a community that highlights and fosters growth of the district's dynamic talent. In fiscal year 23, there were 57 graduates from the residency program. 202 Creates also relaunched co-working days once a month. The co-working day venues were the Mark Manhattan Laundry, the MLK Library, and the Moxie in downtown DC. The annual 202 Creates Month in September started with a kickoff celebration held at The Point in Southwest DC. The celebration amplified the vast creative community that DC has to offer, featuring candle making, floral demonstrations, culinary, dance, a DJ battle, and amazing performances. To close out the fiscal year, the Mayor's Arts Awards ended the month with a bold display of amazing talent and artistry at the historic Lincoln Theater. The city's 38th annual Mayor's Arts Awards celebration was hosted by WUSA 9 on-air personalities Wisdom Martin and Simone D'Alba. The show aired on DCN and is streamed on YouTube. 
The Mayor's Arts Awards honors DC creatives across 14 award categories, one of which honored Jan Duplain as the 2023 recipient of the Mayor's Distinguished Honoree Award. OCTFME demonstrates its dedication to DC residents, businesses, and the creative community by providing open and transparent communication, inclusive and diverse programming and events. We will continue to utilize our various media platforms to promote DC talent and showcase the district as a premier location for film and media production. And lastly, one other fun fact, OCTFME has garnered nearly 100 media stories in the past year and mentions including Essence Magazine, Variety Magazine, the front page of the Washington Post, and Yahoo News. In conclusion, I'd like to thank Mayor Bowser and you, Chairperson White, for your leadership and support, and of course, my mighty team here at the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment for all of their hard work. We appreciate the opportunity to share our accomplishments and future plans and look forward to working with the committee. This concludes my testimony. My staff and I are happy to address any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And thank you and your team. Um, in your questionnaire, your agency listed five strategic priority initiatives. Um, four of the initiatives had an internal date due date of September the 30th, 2023. Uh, which we're able to complete three of them by that particular date. So congratulations on that. Can you update us on the installations of the automatic closed captioning system for the district PEG channels? Uh, I will turn to Bruce Walker on my team to go into further detail about the closed captioning services. Yeah, we're in the, uh, in the process of doing that. We are also have been um, doing it consistently, um, even though you know, we had to get third party services to be able to help us on that, but we're in the process of implementing the system now. Thank you. Um, your office also listed a new TikTok account um, for March 30th. Can you give us an update on your TikTok account? Well, I can tell you that our social media platforms council member have grown by 300% over the past year. So we have been working to make sure that we are engaging our communities through all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok as well. Okay. And, and as I think about that, I've been following um, this, some of the congressional hearings as relates to social media and the role of social media in TV entertainment and, and, and in the effects it has on youth and violence. Uh, TikTok, I think I was watching something yesterday. We were talking about the blackout challenge um, and they did a segment on uh, a mother and a father who lost their child through some blackout challenge. I didn't know what it was. I looked it up and I guess people were holding their breath to they passed out. And I think 12 children died because of that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, as a, as a broadcast entertainment station, do you all think about things like that as relates to messaging to counter some of those narratives? Uh, and Council Member White, thank you for that question. And yes, we are constantly monitoring what's taking place with our youth, which is actually what led us to launch as, as well as conversations with you, Chairman White. Uh, the reason why we launched Speak Out DC. We wanted to give our youth a platform where they could speak in their words, in their language, with their peers about the issues uh, that they are currently encountering and facing. We know that uh, our youth generation is not the same as when we were young because of social media. So we understand uh, some of their concerns, but we thought it was uh, critically important at this moment in time that we give them a platform where they could speak out about their issues and their concerns in a safe space and also look at alternatives, look at solutions, and to be able to engage and interact with each other as well. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I know you all mentioned, uh, well, back in the day, back in my day, we had uh, DC 28, I believe it was that featured uh, some of our uh, local sports uh, games. 
um, and people were excited to see themselves or their children or people in the neighborhood performing and doing great things in different sports. And I think we lost that over the years. I, I do know that when you're doing your presentation, you show some of the footage uh, mm -hmm. from uh, your district knowledge network um, and your sports program increased 125 percent. Can you speak to how you coordinate what games you see or don't broadcast or do broadcast and and how we get that message out to the students? Well, we are uh, making sure that we are producing a variety of different programming, uh, sports being at the top of that. Uh, we are doing a lot around our high school sports because of that very issue, council member. I know that Bruce on our team who heads up our television programming division uh, has been a uh, very compelled to create even new programming. Uh, you saw Game Time, which is brand new, uh, but a host of other programming that is on DKN and DCE, but also because we know that we have to meet our youth where they are. Uh, we are also making sure that we are putting programming on our social media platforms and also that we are uh, evolving into uh, digital gaming and immersive media. And we have programming that touches on that as well. And I will turn it to uh, Associate Director Walker, who could also give uh, some additional details about programming around our sports in the city. Yes, <clears throat> council member, I, I'm happy to talk about this because uh, there's a lot of positive growth, oh, especially over the last three years. I know you, you've had a concern consistently about making sure that the high schools are covered and that we are, are getting that uh, content out there. But I can tell you now, we've expanded coverage. It, we've gone beyond baseball, uh, ba basketball, and football. We're doing volleyball. We're about to do swimming. We're, we're now also giving the opportunity for our high school students, not only to be seen locally, but globally on the DCE network, which is very important. A lot of kids are, are trying to get athletic scholarships. They all, always want to compile tape. They always want to be able to, you know, impress coaches. Well, now the coaches can actually go to the network. So they don't no longer have to, you know, just compile the tapes themselves. Coaches can go to the network and get not only game coverage, but a lot of times we do interviews that are very important to express what they want to do, where they want to go. Um, and I think that gives additional insight. But, you know, we're, we're really proud that not only have we um, expanded in high school, but now we we expanded in the local college coverage. We expanded in amateur sports. We've even covered roller derby. We've covered um, rugby. We've covered all of these different areas now. And in tandem, now we've brought that synergy over to radio where each week we talk about local, professional, high school sports, as well as, you know, where you can go in, in the city to, to see them, as well as going to the city to actually come downtown and enjoy pre and post activities around, you know, the, the game. So um, we're working very hard, but I think one of the biggest components that we have to offer the athletes in this area is that now you can be seen around the world. Wow. And just to build on that, uh, Chairman White and uh, Director Walker, uh, we also are highly focused on boxing. We know that D.C. was once a big boxy town. Yes. It was a city of champions at one point. And you know what? We're getting back to that point. And we have uh, several youth here, uh, native Washingtonians, who are making big headlines and a big name in boxing. Uh, some who are signed directly to Floyd Mayweather uh, coming out of Ward 7, and even some Olympians coming out of our city. So we are very excited to amplify that message and to tell that story and to show youth across this city, across all eight wards, of what is possible no matter where you came from. Even to add to Thank that, you. I just um, I just went to an event at the series, um, Gateway. The Beltway. Um, I'm sorry. We actually entertainment not. sports arena. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I can. I think you're talking, Director Walker. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing to the the, the importance of boxing that the director uh, most eloquently pointed out. Um, that we actually aired the Beltway Battle Series, and we did. We got the replay rights for that fight series, so that was aired well beyond, um, you know, the actual, by, uh, the bouts themselves. And we also did the weigh-ins, we did the press conferences, we did interviews with the fighters, we did all of that. So again, it's not only airing the actual event, but it's going into the event and giving those participating in the event additional exposure. 
And if I could say one more thing in regards to the boxing portion of it, we also had uh, some of the boxers go out with uh, Youth Mayor Addison Rose, and they did a school tour over the summer, uh, early summer before school was out, talking to youth about why it's okay not to be okay. Got that. I did know you have beefed up uh, your YouTube presence. I think you have uh, uh, 4,000 subscribers now with over 1,400 videos uploaded. Uh, what's your goal and mission with the uh, YouTube channel? Well, you know, uh, Chairman White, we love creating a number of media productions. We are looking to expand on everything, uh, as mentioned earlier on. In the past year, we've grown social media by 300%. We have big goals for all of our uh, stations, our platforms, to make sure that we're growing, getting people within our city to make sure that they are constantly watching and learning about the vibrance and even some hidden gems here in our city, but also making sure that we're promoting our city outside of our city through our global uh, network DCE so that we can have an audience on an international scale. Thank you for that. Um... DPR um, has a radio broadcasting program at Deanwood um, with Bo Boosie ba Vegas. Yes. Um, is there a connection with your agency and this programming uh, at, at all? As a matter of fact, there is. Now, I have to commend Bootsy Vegas. He's doing an amazing job. Kudos to him and uh, Director Thede Freeman for what they're doing over there at DPR. And as a matter of fact, we did work with Bootsy Vegas uh, on a production. Uh, I believe it was in Deanwood. And I will turn to uh, Associate Director Walker again uh, for additional details around that. I actually just talked to him yesterday. Um, <laughs> so we started a podcast about three years ago with the Deanwood students and introduced them to the Congressional Award Foundation. Um, that is the only foundation that Congress supports and is chaired uh, by Paxton Baker. And I happen to sit on that board as well. And one mm -hmm. of the things I went to the first, um, actually, award ceremonies, I noticed that there weren't people participating in D.C., kids from D.C. in it. So I asked a question. So we went out and uh, actually got with, with Bootsy and Dean Wood and created a podcast with the Congressional War Foundation. And that foundation, you go through a two-year program and you actually get a Congressional Medal Award and, and the congressman can give you uh, recommendations for scholarships and it's a lot of opportunities. So we created this podcast and we had we took the Dean Wood students and they host it. And then they interviewed the alums that have gone through the program. Well, after the first year, the mayor picked up the program and with the SYEP program. The Congressional Foundation actually did a partnership with them. And now we're three years into the uh, into the broadcast. So uh, we're really happy about this partnership with them. And we've also had some of their students on some of our other programming. In fact, one interesting thing about that is one of their students, I, I think you may have seen it on uh, some of the news clips, but one of their students interviewed Magic Johnson when he came to town. And Magic- I saw that, it was amazing, I saw that. They went viral everywhere. You got yeah, a scholarship, you got a scholarship right? Scholarship. Yeah, so I, yeah. I think, you know, and we're working with them on something else right now that we're doing in June in, in activation at the Entertainment Sports Arena. So we are very, very supportive of them. We're very happy about the success that Bootsy's had with that program. And the kids are absolutely incredible in that program. So that's kind of an update on that. Thank you. I know we DC made, with the help of uh, Mayor Mary Bowser and Kenya McDuffie, Google the official music of the district which has always been um but is now formal in writing in legislation uh, i know you had 75 google related events uh director and i know we had our friend uh we worked to some through some of his issues in ensuring that we can access more of the google community uh tell me uh what has the agency done to uh support the google community um, through grants, through promotions, through inviting them to events, and also uh, to figure out how we can get more of them involved into uh, your network. 
Absolutely, Council Member, and thank you for that question. We have been working feverishly to make sure uh, that members of the GoGo community and those outside of even Washington, D.C. are very familiar with what's going on uh, in the world of GoGo in Washington, D.C. Uh, through our funding, we have been able to not only support, but also create events uh, where we can amplify uh, members of the GoGo community. We've had a number of events, including GoGo at the Golden Triangle, if you could imagine what that was like down uh, on Connecticut Avenue. But we've also been able to support uh, members of the GoGo community, as uh, Cam Poles spoke about earlier, on continents such as Africa. And even right now, we know the Experience Band is in Cuba, and we've been able to support that too. We know about the vibrancy and the culture around GoGo. It's been a part of our lives as far back as we can remember. Uh, and we want to make sure that people here in D.C. Uh, who are new residents and uh, native Washingtonians recognize the importance of GoGo. Uh, we protect it. We promote it. We amplify it. But we also want to make sure that it is getting as proper respect on a national stage and an international stage as well. The funding is open. We make sure that we uh, have a uh, information on our website about uh, the GoGo -Go Fund, how you can apply for that funding is on entertainment.dc.gov. We encourage people to call us if they have any questions at 202-671-0066. We also promote everything that we're doing around GoGo -Go on social media and our monthly newsletter and at all of our events as well. Thank you for that. Um, I was in North Carolina two months ago. Um, with uh, Eric, and and I know they had a global band in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, they got the global band in North Carolina. That's right. You know, and so one thing about it, something about that beat. As soon as you hear it, it just makes you kind of bop a little bit, right? Whether you're from yeah, DC yeah, or yeah. not, it's it's a it's a feel good. It, it you feel go go. Yeah. And, you know, and we know the impact of GoGo, -Go, council member. We can remember during our youth, and I'm about to date myself, I'm about to tell my age, but y'all going to feel me on this. We remember how GoGo -Go influenced a lot of national hits, Salt and Pepper, Kid and Play, Jill Scott, and the list goes on and on. So we know about the impact of GoGo. -Go. We know that national Grammy award-winning recording artists recognize and enjoy GoGo, -Go, which is why they turn to us. We know that hip hop turns to GoGo. -Go. So we just wanna make sure that we're continuing to do all we can to keep GoGo -Go in the forefront, to make sure that we are amplifying uh, the music and the culture. And again, we want to make sure that tourists who come from all over the world, you know, we, we want them to know that we are the land of GoGo. -Go. We are the home of GoGo -Go, and that they feel it the same way we do. Yep. And I, I definitely feel you on though, the impact in, in, of music. I, I hear from Jason mm -hmm. and also Chris Paul about the Kungas and about, you know, or even the sound tracing all the way back to Africa. Um, That's right. Really so, yep. So I, I agree with that. Uh, I want to ask you, 18 businesses participated in the tax rebate program mm -hmm. in the last fiscal cycle. Can you give us a detailed description of what kind of businesses have received those rebates? Uh, which rebates are we speaking of on this one, Chairman? Are we talking about uh, Papa? Tax which one? Program. I'm sorry? Um, the tax rebate program. The film rebate program? Uh, it's listed as tax rebate program, so I'm not sure if it's film. It doesn't say. Uh, we sent the questionnaire. You, you, you uh, responded with 18 businesses participated. So we're trying to get more details on what type of businesses those were for that program. Uh, I'm going to turn to a member of my team. I'm not real sure because we do have a number of different programs. Um, okay. I assume that we're talking about the film rebate program, perhaps, uh, and associate that director. That sounds familiar. What's that? Um, I yeah. think you spoke about that before in the last hearing, but go ahead. Anybody can answer that and give us some clarity on yeah, that. Yeah, good. I, I believe that that you are also talking about the PAPA program, which is a, a, a tax uh, uh, rebate program for uh, entertainment venues that were impacted by, by the pandemic. 
We did have 17 programs in the last two years in the DC Film Rebate Program that was uh, discussed in the sizzle reel and also in, in the director's um, uh, testimony. But I think uh, uh, Creative Affairs uh, Director Kanisha Davey or our General Counsel Lawrence Cooper can speak to the PAPA program and the uh, businesses that applied for and are receiving uh, rebates from their application last year. Thank you, Ms. Davey. I, I'm unable to turn my video on, but I hope you can hear me. Uh, with respect to the Performing Arts Promotion Amendment Act, real property tax rebate, uh, the Office of Tax and Revenue, which you know obviously deals with taxes, had actually up until you know fiscal year 23 received those applications and determined them for eligibility. We had gotten involved doing. COVID to ensure that these businesses that qualify and these what we're talking about is performing arts venues that are less than 300 seat capacity. And the statute requires that if they host at least 40 hours of live performances a month for each month of the year, they can get a tax rebate on their real property taxes of up to $15,000. We've been involved just trying to get, you know, potential venues involved. And last year, uh, during COVID, things dropped and they didn't get a lot of applications. Uh, a group of the venues had uh, pursued our agency actually receiving and reviewing the applications. We did do that this year. And I can say that uh, there were additional venues that previously had not applied in different areas of the city. And there were maybe about 17 applications this year. And we hope to continue to promote that for eligible uh, venues. Got it. Was anyone want to add to that? Or? No, I would say, hello, council member. Um, our general counsel, Lawrence, he summed it up very well. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how many films uh, and or TV shows were filmed in the district in the past fiscal cycle? Um, I know uh, part of your leadership director, you talked about expanding um, access to filming in the district. In fact, I, I joined you and some of your staff at a, at a movie filming mm -hmm. here in the district it was amazing you know i can i couldn't believe they were doing that many that one scene that many times i think yeah. they did one scene the whole time i was there <laughs> <laughs> well you know what That's chairman white we are so excited about what we are able to do here uh with film and television productions and yes we do remember having you uh on site actually uh, that one, uh, I think we can talk about it now. That was for Marvel when it was here in D.C. filming uh, a few months ago. And we've had a number of great films that have been filmed here uh, in the past year, uh, Chairman White. Uh, the highly anticipated Netflix Rustin, which you saw in our sizzle reel, uh, was filmed here in Washington, D.C., it also starred uh, DC native Academy Award nominee, Jeffrey Wright, who recently joined Mayor Bowser uh, and members of the administration at the launch of the SYEP program this year. So we're very excited about that production. We also know that local um, producer Tressa Smallwood of Megamind is now nominated for an NAACP Image Award for the film on the Tanisa Welch story that was filmed right here in Washington, D.C. as well, along with Vivica Fox and Judge Greg Mathis. Uh, that was also filmed, actually, it's interesting to know, another fun fact, part of that was filmed right in the Deanwood area of Ward 7. And then we have Octet Productions, led by Chuck and Bree West. Uh, they uh, partnered up with award-winning producer Tracy Edmund, who we all know from the film Soul Food, the series Soul Food, BET's Quad, and College Hill, to produce a film called Wake. Uh, Tracy Edmund spent over uh, a month here uh, in the month of March filming, 
casting and so forth for that film. So we're very excited about that and all the other productions that are coming out of Octet, including a Wesley Family Christmas on Paramount BET, a Hush that's on All Black with a number of uh, local uh, DC residents and stars, uh, and a number of other productions that have taken place in the city as well. So uh, film and television, we're able to attract a number of great films and media productions right here to the city. And I want to give kudos to our associate director, Herbie Niles, for all that he's been do doing and his team uh, to ensure that we continue to be able to bring more films and productions uh, of uh, large and small scale. Thank you. I was muted. Are there any new initiatives or events? I know you're doing a lot and growing exponentially. Uh, interested in launching or have your thoughts on in the upcoming fiscal year? As far as initiatives? Yeah. Right now, uh, Chairman White, one of the big initiatives that we are uh, highly focused on is Be Downtown. Uh, we know how important it is for us to make sure that we are encouraging more uh, residents and tourists and uh, so forth, more foot traffic uh, in the downtown area. Uh, so we are continuing to promote events uh, in downtown. We had a number of them during fiscal year 23, including those during Cinco de Mayo, where we partnered uh, with other government agencies as as well as radio stations. Um, but we have also had a number of film screenings and other events. We will continue to do that as well as producing more uh, television and radio content that also promotes the vibrancy of our downtown. We know how important it is to get people back downtown. We have a lot of businesses, a lot of uh, black owned businesses that we wanna make sure that we're shedding a light on. So that is one of the big initiatives that we are working on in this current fiscal year. Yeah. Got it. Um, I don't know if you're seeing and hearing this, um, but to your point of downtown, we've been having some conversations around revitalizing and strengthening downtown in the midst of what's going on economically. Uh, does your agency uh, anticipate uh, any drop in, in funding or services uh, due to uh, unexpected uh, loss in revenue? At this point, uh, our funding is sufficient and we continue to uh, produce more content uh, to bring people downtown, to encourage more traffic downtown uh, so that others can experience the vibrancy in the downtown that we know. Uh, we're pushing content out uh, on our social media platforms and on all of our different platforms. But right now, we think our funding is sufficient. Thank you. As I learn more about uh, what you guys are doing with O C T F M E. Uh, Director, tell me what's how do you pronounce the acronym? Because I've heard it three different ways. <laughs> so I was listening as uh different <laughs> as different uh, um, of our uh, witnesses mentioned it today. I just like to say O C T F M E. It's easier that way. But if for for okay. others, maybe just saying the Office of Entertainment off me works. Um, but yeah, I, I just say O C T F M E. Okay, so it's it's four it's four different ones. I got it. Okay, All but right. none of them are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> got you. Uh, let me ask you this: uh, Can you differentiate um, these different networks like DKN, mm -hmm. uh, DCN, and DCE? Absolutely. Uh, so DCN, of course, uh, showcases the mayor's press conferences uh, and other programming uh, that's highlighting uh, the vibrancy and the culture of the city. Uh, then we have DCC, which is the district uh, council's uh, network, uh, which we are on today. Then we have DKN, uh, the District Knowledge Network, that has a variety of different programming, anywhere from uh, one of the programs that we mentioned uh, during the testimony, Crushing the Game, uh, to uh, cooking shows, uh, our youth and um, DPR and a variety of others. And then we have our global streaming network, uh, maybe even the only big city that has one, uh, DCE, where we are able to touch people globally with our content. Uh, we have a variety of sports, as uh, Director Walker mentioned earlier, uh, the Beltway Battles that took place at the Entertainment and Sports Arena. That aired right on our DCE network, and we are promoting that all over 
over uh, to make sure that not only people here in Washington, D.C. are taking advantage of this platform that we have, but also promoting it uh, outside of the city nationally and internationally. Thank you for that. Inclusion. And then we don't want to forget also our D.C. radio, our partnership with WHUR, Howard University, and that is on our HD station, HD4. Thank you. And in closing, uh, I often run into my, my seniors, I should say seasoned citizens, mm -hmm. um, and they watch pretty much all your channels, the hearings, the, the, their home, most of them, them that I encounter, that are home. Uh, are able to engage and hear and learn about what's going on throughout the district through your networks. Uh, are there any, is there anything that you do that specializes just for our senior population in the district? Well, actually, right now, we're currently in the process of producing new programming. Uh, we want to ensure that all of our programming is inclusive of our uh, seasoned citizens, uh, because we want to give them a front row to everything that's taking place here in our city. We want to make sure that they are up close and personal with what's going on downtown, what's going on throughout all eight wards, what's happening here in our government, but also so they know too about hidden gems. Now, I'll tell you something that we've also learned, and uh, the Department of Aging and Community Living, uh, which is led by uh, our good friend, Sharon Hines, these are not the seniors from our past. These seniors are very active. Uh, they're out yes. doing things and we want to make sure that yes. we're keeping them engaged on all things that are taking place in the city. You know, there are some we want to make sure that they have um, a front row to what's taking place if they uh, are unable to come out and attend. But we also want to make sure that we're reaching that population of those seniors who like to be out and about so they know where to go. What's popping, as the kids would say, what's what's the hot spots? Um, I can tell you, my father, I won't give his age, but uh, he's a, a seasoned citizen. He likes to be out and about. And he was at one of our events recently after he learned about it. And I looked and he was on the 360 photo booth. Uh, and I'll just say Hello. he's. <laughs> so we want to uh -huh. make sure that we are keeping our seasoned citizens included. Uh, and we are also keeping them very active as well. Thank you for, for this. Um, I want to thank uh, you, director, and, and your staff for your remarkable work. Uh, you are doing throughout the city and giving a voice and a, and, a, and a platform to so many of our creatives, global community, and just broadcasting that you do, uh, even informing people what laws and legislation has been proposed and passed throughout the district. As a final note to this hearing, if anyone cannot testify or would like to submit written testimonies to be included in an official record, uh, you can go to our hearing page uh, or access our hearing management system. And you can email us, submit a testimony at ryA at dccouncil.gov. The official record will close on Wednesday, February the 15th, 2024 at 6 p.m. With no other business before us, it is now 10.59 a.m. And this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Chairman White. And thank you, mighty OCTFME team. All you see on the screen and all who are here at the headquarters as well.